The five pillars of Islam are five basic acts in Islam considered mandatory by believers and are the foundation of Muslim life. They are summarized in the famous Hadith of Gabriel. The Shia and Sunni both agree on the essential details for the performance and practice of these acts, but the Shia do not refer to them by the same name. For Muslims, actions speak louder than words. It's not enough to just have faith in Allah. They believe it's necessary to show religious commitment through their actions and their lifestyle. Every action in Islam is a form of worship because their life should be lived in submission to Allah. This idea is referred to as ibadah. Muslims have always been very clear that Islam is a complete way of life and that in everything they do, they should show submission and worship. For them, worship is a 24-7 reality to be lived fully, not just as an afterthought that's practiced once a week. Therefore, the five pillars of Islam become really important as a way of showing commitment to Allah through their lives. So why are they called pillars? Well, a pillar is something that holds up or supports. And in the same way then, the five pillars of Islam are the things that support and uphold the Muslim faith. However, these actions have to be carried out with the right intention or naya, the true intention to submit to the will of God. The Quran makes many references to their importance and in his last sermon, Prophet Muhammad makes clear mention to them. In that sermon he says, O oh people, listen to me in earnest. Worship God, perform your five daily prayers, fast during the month of Ramadan and offer zakat. Perform hajj if you have the means. The fact that these are mentioned in the final sermon could demonstrate how important they are. Muhammad wanted to leave his followers with the thing that was most important and most fundamental to their faith. So the first pillar of Islam is the Shahada. Now for paper one of all the pillars, this is arguably the most important and the one you need to know in most detail. The Shahada is essentially the Muslim declaration of faith. This states that I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of God. This therefore reflects the monotheistic nature of Islam. Muslims recite the Shahada daily and at key milestones throughout their life, arguably making it one of the most important practices. It may take on slightly different forms or have variations in terms of how it's phrased. For example, one version of the Shahada is the Adhan or call to pray. Muslim soldiers will also say it when they're going into battle. However, regardless of the version, the main message will always be the same. It expresses their submission to just one God and commitment to following the teachings and example of Prophet Muhammad. Now in your first exam, you need to know about different times when the Shahada is recited. The examples we're going to look at today are birth, the seven day rite of passage, conversion, marriage and death. However, you could also talk about the Adhan if you wanted to, which is the call to pray. The first example we're going to have a look at is the Muslim birth rites. When a child has been born, a version of the Shahada known as the Adhan is whispered in the right ear of the child, normally by the child's mother or father. The Adhan is the call to prayer and says, God is great, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, come to pray. This is the child's first experience and calling to Islam, so Muslims want this to be a positive experience for them. In order to make this a positive experience, the parents will chew a piece of date or fruit and rub the juice along the baby's gums. This is believed to start the baby's digestive system, but is also believed to have been performed by Muhammad, the main role model for Muslims. This ensures then that the baby's first experience of Islam and the Shahada is a positive, sweet experience. Seven days following the birth, Muslims often perform the Akika ceremony. This is another opportunity to say the Shahada and is believed to be the first initiation into Islam. For the Akika, Muslims will arrange a sacrifice of a goat or lamb on behalf of the child. It's a way of giving thanks to Allah for the gift of the child. The meat from that animal is distributed to the poor or it can be used to arrange a feast to which the poor as well as relatives and friends are invited. During that sacrifice, the Shahada is recited. In addition to the sacrifice, the baby's head is shaved. The hair is then weighed and the equivalent weight in gold is given to charity. Like many practices in Islam, this event is important as it was performed by the early prophets and leaders. For example, the prophet Ibrahim, a prophet known for his devotion and submission, is believed to have performed a kika. Ibrahim had a dream which he interpreted to mean that he should sacrifice his son. Ibrahim the next day prepared to carry out that sacrifice, but Allah then spoke to him. Having proved that he was devoted to Allah and would submit to Allah's will, Allah allowed him to sacrifice an animal in its place. This reflects the emphasis placed on devotion and commitment to Allah and only Allah. 
The next example of when the Shahada might be recited is conversion. However, Muslims believe that every individual is born a Muslim and that we all have a natural instinct to believe in Allah. Hence why converts in Islam are often referred to as reverts, as they believe that that faith in Allah is a natural instinct. As such, Muslims see their role as being reminders. Things like evangelism or attempts to convert people are not encouraged in Islam. However, for those that do wish to convert or revert to Islam, it's an easy process. All one has to do is declare the Shahada three times. Once a person says this declaration of faith with conviction and understanding of its meaning, then he or she becomes a Muslim. In stating the Shahada, they're essentially committing to showing submission to Allah through their lifestyle and worship, and to following the teachings and examples set by Prophet Muhammad in the holy books. Muslims will also recite the Shahada during their marriage or nikah ceremony. Muslim couples don't generally recite vows, but rather listen to the words of the Imam or leader who speaks about the significance and commitment of marriage and the couple's responsibility to one another and to Allah. During the marriage service, the Shahada is usually recited and the bride and groom are asked three times whether they accept one another. Following this, they sign the nikah or marriage contract. The Shahada therefore plays an important role. Not only the couples accept in a personal faith in Allah, but in saying the Shahada, they're essentially joining the couple together in both marriage and faith. According to Muhammad, this will help strengthen the marriage. In the Hadith, Prophet Muhammad said, Choose the one with faith and you will have success. Now this is a useful teaching to learn because you can use it again in paper two in the relationships unit if you get given a question on interfaith marriages. Finally, another important time when Muslims are expected to say the Shahada is when death is approaching. In Islam, when death is approaching, it's an obligatory or compulsory act to lie down on your back in such a way that the soles of your feet face the direction of Mecca. This relates to their beliefs about life after death and resurrection. It's recommended to say by yourself or repeat after someone else the declaration of faith or shahada. In saying the shahada, the person is essentially reconfirming their belief in Allah and is a final way of showing commitment before judgment. This is a more developed version of the Shahada that demonstrates their commitment to all aspects of Islam. When death is approaching, they say, I have accepted Allah as Lord, Muhammad as the Prophet, Islam as the religion, the Quran as the book, and I declare my love for them and declare my disassociation with their enemies. The second pillar of Islam is that of Salat or Salah, the practice of praying five times a day. The duty to pray five times a day. Muslims say these prayers in Arabic and go through a series of movements called a raqa'ah. The number of raqa'ahs will depend on which prayer is being performed. Before Muslims pray, they must remove their shoes and perform a special wash called wudu. Then they must make sure that their body is fully covered. Women should wear a headscarf. Finally, they need to find a clean space in which to pray. A prayer mat will do, and must face in the right direction, the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. This is called the Qibla. For Muslims, prayer is one of the most important ways to worship God. It's a duty for Muslims to pray five times a day, and Prophet Muhammad called prayer the pillar of religion, as it reminds Muslims to give thanks for God's blessings and is an important part of submitting to God's will. For Muslims, prayer is a physical, mental and spiritual activity that draws believers closer to God. Muslims are expected to pray five times a day at the allocated time set out clearly in the Islamic prayer schedule. However, if one misses a prayer, then it's acceptable to catch up later. However, it would be seen as a sin to miss prayer regularly without a valid reason. Prophet Muhammad in the Hadith said, If one of you sleeps and misses a prayer or forgets it, let him offer the prayer when he remembers. This shows that it's actually the act of prayer that's important, not the allocated times. So why do Muslims pray five times a day? Well, the practice of praying five times a day relates to a story found in both the Quran and the Hadith in which Prophet Muhammad goes on a night journey. During this journey, Allah reveals to him that Muslims should pray continuously 50 times a day. However, the Prophet Musa or Moses intervened and said that was too much. Eventually, it was agreed that they would pray five times a day instead. The third pillar of Islam is that of zakat or zakah, the practice of giving 2.5% of wealth in charity every year. All Muslims are expected to be charitable as a regular duty. 
However, zakat refers specifically to the giving of 2.5% of their wealth every year. Although zakat is sometimes called a tax, Muslims don't think of it in this way, but rather as a religious duty. Muslims can be sure that God will reward them for their acts of giving. The Quran says that they should give to the poor, those in need, widows, orphans and travellers. It says, give in charity and I will bless your wealth. As such, Muslims believe that when they give in charity, Allah blesses them with spiritual rewards. Zakat is often referred to as the purification of wealth, as they believe that through giving, they're cleansing themselves of negative things like temptation, greed and pride, and remembering that everything is on loan from Allah. In addition, Muslims believe that as caliphs or guardians of the planet, the money they have should be used to help the world and those within it. Muslims can also give voluntary donations in addition to the obligatory zakat. This is known as sadaqa. This can be financial donations, but also the giving of time, volunteering or general acts of kindness. During festivals, they'll often make an additional effort to practice sadaqa. The fourth pillar of Islam is swam or the practice of fasting during the month of Ramadan. For Muslims, Ramadan is the holiest month of the year, being a time dedicated to self-discipline and spiritual reflection. Fasting is a deliberate control of the body and Muslims are expected to refrain from eating and drinking, including water during sunlight hours. They may also give up smoking and sexual intercourse and may make additional efforts to avoid negative thoughts or actions. Ramadan holds a special place for Muslims because it's believed to be the month in which Prophet Muhammad received the first verses of the Quran. As such, Muslims should try and attend the mosque on the 27th day of Ramadan to celebrate the night of power or Laylat al-Qadr. This remembers the day of the first revelation of the Quran. So why do Muslims fast? Well, the practice of fasting has become important for numerous reasons. Firstly, it was commanded in the Quran and follows the example of Prophet Muhammad, who fasted during the revelation of the Quran. It also focuses the mind on Allah and develops a Muslim's commitment to him. In addition, during their fasting, Muslims are remembering the suffering of others within the community and therefore they're encouraged to act with charity. It also promotes self-discipline needed to become a better Muslim. According to the Quran, fasting is good for us even if we don't realise it. It says, but to fast is best for you if only you knew. The fifth and final pillar of Islam is that of Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca. All Muslims are expected to go on Hajj at least once in their lifetime. However, if that's not possible, then it's their naya or intention that counts and Allah will still reward them for this. There are, however, certain rules that need to be followed. They have to be of sound mind in order to understand the importance of Hajj. They have to be physically fit to be able to cope with the strain of the five day journey. And they have to be able to pay for Hajj without getting money from haram or forbidden means. As Prophet Muhammad said, Hajj should only be practiced if you have the means. The Quran makes it clear that Muslims should perform Hajj. It says and proclaim that the people shall observe Hajj pilgrimage. They will come to you walking or riding on various exhausted means of transportation. They will come from the farthest locations. Now, Hajj not only helps Muslims develop their personal relationship with Allah, but it also helps strengthen the Umar or Muslim community. This unity between Muslims is expressed through the clothing that they wear. Muslims enter into a state of mind and preparation known as Iram. However, the term Iram is also used for the white cloth worn by Muslims during this time. The simple clothing shows the equality between all members of the community, and that in that community there's no difference between wealth and status. Before Allah, they are all equal. The symbolism of Hajj goes back to stories regarding numerous prophets, including Adam and his wife Eve or Hawa. After the fall, Adam and Eve were banished from paradise. However, they asked Allah for forgiveness, which Allah, being forgiving, gave them. During Hajj, Muslims visit the Mount of Mercy in Arafat, where they too face Allah and ask for forgiveness. Muslims seem to imply that this asking for forgiveness in Arafat was one of the most important parts of Hajj, saying, Hajj is Arafat. Zafraz is on his way to the Mount of Mercy, one of Islam's holiest sites. Going to the foot of this mountain, it's the Mount of Mercy. This is the place on the top there where that pillar is. That's the place where Adam was stood when uh, he found Eve. That's where his uh, forgiveness was accepted. And when the Holy Prophet came to do Hajj, he stood at the bottom here and he prayed. As a way of offering thanks to Allah, Adam and Eve are said to have built a shrine, the first ever building, in order to worship Allah. This shrine is known today as the Kaaba, sometimes known as the House of Allah. 
It's a plain cube-shaped building. In the Quran it says Allah has made the Kaaba a sacred house, an asylum of security and benefits for mankind. During Hajj, Muslims practice Tawaf, where they walk around the Kaaba seven times to show that their life revolves around Allah. The topic of Hajj comes up in more detail in paper two, so there's a second video available if you need further information on the main features of Hajj. However, on the following slides, there are some potential exam questions that you can try to test your knowledge of the five pillars and the practice of Shahada. Good luck!